it's, it's a rare moment when I get to speak to just men. So this is actually super cool. And, uh, you know, how many know that we can address maybe some different things than what we would uh, if it were a mixed crowd? And so I don't get a lot of that. And so it's, it's really cool to do that. Uh, because in the day and age that we live in right now, um, how many know that our gender is under attack? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, they, the enemy has sought to remove men from society uh, because in many ways um, we hold a certain standard and a certain representation of who God is. I mean, you know, there's a difference between a woman's love and a father's love. Yeah, man. And um, the way you see God is the way is the type of relationship that you have with your natural father. Until you renew your mind out of it, Come because on. that's the way you're designed, and um, and so it's such a powerful tool to catapult the next generation into a relationship with a loving father that's an authority figure, but at the same time loves you and has your back. And so the enemy try has been really ramping up uh, an attack against our gender, and so uh, we have to not get offended, not get mad. And but still stay true to represent a um, healthy and godly masculinity in a society that does not know what masculinity is. A good portion of the attack is to say that all masculinity is toxic and unhealthy. And so they, they, they're, they're just an attempt to take down um, our gender. And so uh, how many know God's not going to stand for that? Amen. Amen. And we can make a decision to stand with God as he makes a decision not to stand for that. Um, but one of the challenges with a lot of us is we didn't really have a healthy male role model, maybe model in our own lives or even model in the church. Because I'd say in the past hundred years or so, uh, the church hasn't really known what to do with men. And, um, you know, we're doers. And we're not great sitters, and um, and so and then there's been this just um, I mean, you know the the presentation of Jesus hasn't always been a masculine presentation. Right. They've tried to emasculate Jesus and you know put him like he's this effeminate, long-haired, blonde-haired guy with blue eyes who you know never did any type of anything aggressive or I mean, you know, there's a time when Jesus made a whip fashioned it, sat down, walked into a religious place and tossed the tables into the air and cracked the whip and drove everybody out of the temple as the Son of God. I mean, you know, that doesn't sound unmasculine to me. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's a level of authority that he walked in that came out of that place. Um, and so God wants to restore in our eyes that it's okay to be a man. Come it's on. okay to be strong. Yeah. It's okay to be aggressive. It's okay to be a protector. And we're not called to be doormats. We're called to take a stand. And God has called us to that. And so, but because of the fact that we haven't had great role models necessarily in the church or our home life, um, a lot of times what's happened is um, we allowed Hollywood <coughs> to define for us what a man was. My, my parents were divorced when I was five years old. Uh, my dad didn't want to have anything to do with me. Um, I did from five until about sophomore in high school. I didn't even see my dad. Uh, no support, no child support, nothing. And um, wrote a letter to him in, th in third grade, and he, he sent it back to me, correcting my grammar and my spelling, and wrote a small note on the back. And so my relationship with my dad was non-existent. And so I didn't have that role model. And so I looked to Hollywood. I looked to the world. And what the world told me was a man was someone who could sleep with a lot of girls. And that's what being a man was. And I had an uncle who took that same path. And so um, he was a womanizer. And, to, and so it was presented to me that that's what being a man was. And so that's the path I chose. Not having a father. Not having a godly example or influence. And so I walked down that road. And, um, you know, initially that's a fun road. How I many of the Bible says sin's pleasurable for a season? But eventually it's not. And then it ended up being total bondage, man. And my identity got wrapped up in that, and I did not know what a man was. <coughs> a true man. And, um, 
And even the people that, you know, sowed the seeds of the gospel into my heart, they weren't representations of that. And so, how many know that God wants, how many of everybody in this room, you got a father? Amen. You got a dad in heaven. Amen. And he's the greatest dad you've ever had. Come on. Amen. There is no greater dad. He loves you. He believes in you. He's proud of you. He's on your team. He's on your side. And uh, he is the number one person that you have in your corner. You don't have anybody that believes in you more than your dad does. Amen. But how many know that that can be a reality without us actually experiencing that? Because we've never opened our hearts to a relationship with God as a father to us. That's right. I struggled with that initially. I could see him as a friend, because I had lots of friends, but I could not see him as a dad, because I had no frame of reference for a healthy perspective of that. And then I had bad uh, experiences in the church, uh, you know, with pastors and leaders and, um, you know, just um, it just the, the, the failure of man went on and on and on. But then finally, when it came to Father God, the buck stopped there, and he began to show me what it was like to have a father that loved me, was present in my life, believed in me, and knew me just the way I was, but still loved me and was not going to reject me or get rid of me for any reason. And as that began to happen in my life, I began to find out what it was to be a man. And then I made the decision that I'm not going to do what was done to me. I'm not going to put my children through the pain of living fatherless. Yeah. I'm not going to be the dad that I had. I'm going to be the dad that was deposited down inside of me by Father God and set an example on the earth of what being a man is all about, passing that masculinity on to my sons so that they can do the same thing. How many of the Bible says that God will turn the hearts of the fathers back to the sons and the sons back to the fathers? Right? How many of that is a prophecy for the end times? And uh, the day and age that we're living in. Because when the hearts of the fathers are not toward the children, and the hearts of the children are not toward the fathers, we cannot pass on any type of baton or wisdom to the next generation. Yeah. And so what happens is we keep, we drop the, our, the generation drops the baton. And they pick it back up. And, they're try, and they can't pass it to this one. And then that one drops the baton. No one passes anything. We don't build on wisdom and strength. And we start every generation as fools. Yeah. Now, it's not, it doesn't, it's not in every single instance, but if you look at the masses, that's what's been happening. The primary thing the enemy attacks is not us, it's the young people. Mm-hmm. He wants to get the young people off course early and to get them in a state of rebellion, thinking our generation is idiots, and then we join in and chime in that they are, they are idiots. Come on, he might complain about the younger generation. Can we be honest? With you? <laughs> Everybody like, we are holy, Jeremiah. We don't know what you're talking about. We've all done it. We don't understand. And how many of you so what ends up happening is, and, I, and I'm not encouraging that, but if we disrespect them and they don't respect us, how many of we can't help them? That's right. And we can't fulfill what we're actually called to do. So there has to be this place where we lay down this sense of disrespect and take up a place of respect. So that we can love on these young people and they can start. See, notice it says turn the hearts of the fathers first. Right. That's the initiating response. Not turn the hearts of the children to the fathers. No. When our hearts turn to them, their hearts will automatically turn to us. Because that's the way they're designed. Amen. And we can only do that as we know God as a father and enjoy that place of relationship and allow it to cleanse our hearts. And see, and, and what I'm about to say is like the most simple thing in the world, but it's kind of like, how do you know that when you're nailing a hammer into wood, one swing of the hammer doesn't do the job? You can nail it one time. Well, there is a message that just as sure as the hands were, the, 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 the nail was hammered into Jesus' hand on the cross. There's a message that's called the good news of the gospel that's got to be preached over and over and over and over again. Because one preaching of the gospel is not going to nail the hammer into the hand of your belief that the cross was a success. You've got to hear it over and over and over and over again. Yes. And I do too. I've got to keep hearing it. I've got to keep preaching it. It's the primary message of the scriptures. 
It is truly what we're called to believe. Everything else is a side dish. <laughs> what is it? It's this. Everybody in this room. How I many know we have all sinned, gentlemen? Who okay. <laughs> knew? I, I, I dare say that many of us have had, could could fill up many buckets with our transgression. <laughs> Myself, I used to be a drug addict, alcoholic, atheist, lying, cheating, awful person, homeless, on drugs. The list goes on and on. Yeah. But all of our sin, two thousand years ago, was nailed on the cross and condemned in the body of Jesus Christ. And God has taken your sin and my sin and removed it as far as the east to the west. And if you're in Christ Jesus, God sees no sin in you any longer. Amen. Amen. And Hebrews chapter 8. Right? Let's read it. Who's got a Bible? Well, dang. Are we at men's prayer breakfast? What's going on? Or is We've got bacon. Bud's going to grab one. Oh, gosh, brother. All right, throw it to me. We'll see what happens. No way. There you go. This is cruel. This is a cruel thing. No, no. I will pull my phone out and read. What's guy? Pretty small. Nope. Nope. <laughs> 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 What's wrong with you people? <laughs> <laughs> it's the cold temperature uh, shrinks our brain. <laughs> yeah, it's the wood has been whipped in our hearts. <laughs> okay. Got it. It's a print I can read. Now, it's like the best news in the world, right? The news I'm about to share with you is so good, it's going to be difficult to believe it. God prophesied in the book of Acts. He said, I'm going to do a work in your day that's so good, you're going to struggle to believe it. And that's what I'm about to share with you. This, what I'm about to share with you is the truth. Y'all believe the scriptures are true? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay? So if it's in the book, then it's true. Right? And so what I'm about to share with you, if you can get a hold of this, it'll revolutionize your relationship with God. And you'll no longer see him as a taskmaster. You'll no longer see him as someone who's looking down on you critically, avoiding you, condemning you, ready to punish you. And you'll actually feel safe to draw near into a place of relationship with him. That's real and alive. Not a show. And personal. And so the product of all of this is the covenant that he gave us at the cross. I mean, there's an old covenant and a new covenant, right? Amen. I mean, the old covenant was fulfilled by Jesus. New covenant was began by Jesus. So now you have a new covenant. And I mean, it's important to understand your covenant. Anybody got a phone contract in here? Yeah. I mean, no, that's a covenant, right? You keep your end of the covenant, you get phone service. You're, you stop sending them money, your phone service stops, right? It's a covenant, right? Two sides of the deal. Well, God has a covenant in the New Testament, and um, it's different in the Old. The Old Testament covenant was based upon our ability uh, to perform, to do, to act, New Covenant is actually God's good news and what he's done in Jesus Christ. And he actually cut that covenant not with us, but with his son. New Covenant's cut between Father God and Jesus. I mean, Father God's perfect. Yep. I mean, Jesus is perfect. Yep. Amen. How many know when you get born again, it says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Right? Yeah, right. All things pass away, all things become new. If you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, you are in Christ this morning. Is there anything wicked in Jesus? No. no. Is there anything bad in Jesus? No. Twist it. Huh? No. no. If you're in Jesus, you're good. Can I get an amen? Amen. Because God has made you good. And so now that you're in Christ, God has made this covenant between himself and his son. And so now that covenant, we are a part of, but we didn't we didn't have to keep our end or pay anything. Can I get an amen? I mean, he paid it all. Yeah. He paid for it. We stepped into it. And what that means is we cannot mess this covenant up because we didn't write it, we didn't start it, we just came into Christ, and it was between Jesus and his Father, and now this perfect covenant we can't break. If you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. Let's look at what it is. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor... And his brother saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least of the greatest. Verse 12. Because. Now here's the clause of the new covenant. This is the most important thing. Because. 
Because of this next statement, all those former things that I said to you are true. Because I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Not only are you forgiven, not only are you in Christ, but when God sees you, he does not see your sin anymore. Amen. Past, present, or future. That'll preach. <laughs> <laughs> it's preaching it is literally the best news in the world. But how many of y'all, who would say that that is a little difficult to believe? Yeah. yeah. Can we be honest? Yeah. Myself included. It's a mind bender because we've been taught for so long that God was so much more aware of our sin than he was of his son, of his righteousness, of his blood. What are you talking about, Jeremiah? Listen, if God remembers your sin, then Jesus did not successfully complete the mission. So, therein, once again, in order for us to enjoy God as a father and to enjoy this relationship, we have to believe the cross is a success. In order to believe such amazing news, we have to hear it regularly so that we'll believe it. Yeah. Just like the hammer that hits the nail and drives it into the wood. The gospel is the power of God and the salvation. And this is the message that we do not produce our own right standing with God. We do not produce our own righteousness that our righteousness is not an action it's not a church attendance it's not an offering it's not a deed it's not an act our righteousness is a person <coughs> and his name is jesus Amen. and if you believe you step into this christ and you cease to exist in the form that you were before you become crucified with Christ on the cross 2,000 years ago you lay down your old identity and you take on your new identity as a son <clears throat> and that, and you never look back, and it never stops you. Because what God has done in you is greater than your own failure, greater than the failure of Adam. God's, God, God's seed that he's sown into our hearts, that incorruptible seed of the word of God, has the ability to maintain your identity through all the trials and tribulations and temptations and failures of your life. Because I have some children, I have three kids, and, I, and, they're, and you can look at these kids and tell them they're, they're my kids. <clears throat> How do you know my, my DNA and my genetics will always be within those kids? They will never stop being my children. <clears throat> they can change their name. They can change their haircut. They can change anything about them. But my DNA is wrapped inside of them. If my human seed is strong enough to maintain their identity throughout their entire existence, how much more the incorruptible seed of the Word of God Come able on. to maintain your identity and my identity Come as children of God on our good days, our bad days, our ups and our downs. Yeah. Yeah. This identity will not be taken from you. The only thing the enemy can do is try to convince you that it's been stolen. And if you believe that, then you will experience that. Wait till my Jeremiah. I have a, a two. I have a two-year-old now, two-year-old little girl, and a five-year-old and a seventeen-year-old. Mm -hmm. Have you ever taken the nose of a two-year-old before? Yeah. <laughs> I got your nose. I mean, a two-year-old can lose their minds over the fact that you have. <laughs> they will fight you. They will, you know, bite your little brother. You know what I'm saying? Like, give me my nose. I hate it. Ah! <laughs> now, how many know the, the nose? You can't eat the, you're not eating the nose. But in their mind, they think you are. And so they're upset. Yeah. Simple illustration, right? <laughs> this is what the enemy tries to do to your identity. <clears throat> you're not a son of God anymore. You've messed up. You're not a son of God. You're not worthy. You're not right. I got your righteousness. I got your <laughs> and how many know the enemy? Everything I've just described, how many know that? It's ludicrous to think you're actually taking a two-year-old's nose, right? Yeah. It, it's equally, if not more ludicrous, to think that the enemy can take your right standing with God as a result of making you fail. That's right. For sure. So as long as we'll stay awake to this righteousness and keep hearing the gospel and keep hammering the nail, then our relationship with God will be vital and powerful 
And we won't run from God when we fail. We'll run to Him. That's right. Amen. That's what. That's what. That's the. That's the difference between David and all the everybody else in the Old Testament. God didn't pick Isaiah as a man after His own heart. God didn't pick Ezekiel or Jeremiah or anything. He picked David. David. David could have had his own Jerry Springer show, right? <laughs> yeah. David would be in prison by today's standards. I mean, killed someone in cold blood and slept with his wife. Committed adultery. This is a man after God's own heart. Gee, God, I think you can make better choices, right? You know, Because God doesn't look on the outside of man. God does not look at a man's failures. God does not look at a man's sin. God looks at a man's heart. If I can find a man who will trust in my goodness rather than his own, that's a man after my own heart. Because when he fails, he won't run from me. He'll run to me, and I'll clean him up, and I'll fix him up, and I'll be a father to him, and he'll be a son to me. That's the plan of God. So, ah, cue journey song. Don't stop <laughs> believing. Oh, oh. <laughs> Come on, Peter, help me out. <laughs> we all know Peter's restraining himself from singing the full song correctly. <laughs> Being a Giants fan and all. That's there. right. That's what we love, right? That guy's got a super high voice. No, he does. I can't even. <laughs> Y'all know what song I was trying to say. Yeah, right. Steve Perry. And so, in closing, all these things are simply accomplished by looking at Jesus. All these things are simply accomplished by understanding that you're forgiven. And that God loves you and he wants to be a father to you. There's never. See, and, 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 and the last thing I'll say, I feel pretty good, is this. There's a lot of pressure on men. And, uh, you know. Got to be strong. Got to be tough. Got to move forward. You're a man. And, and the, the, one of the sad things about what that does to us a lot of times is men can be some of the loneliest people on the planet. Yeah. Because we don't open up to people well. Mm -mm. We, we, we take all of our problems and we suck it up and we go through it. We don't talk to each other. And we, we have more of a tendency to isolate than women. Now, we'll get together. We'll laugh. We'll make fun of each other. But when it comes to really opening up our hearts and talking about what we're struggling with, we don't do that. Yeah. And as a result of that, many of us are fighting battles like we're alone. When God would love for us to be able to open our hearts to each other and to see that we have brothers around us who are with us in battle, and they have our back. Amen. <laughs> we need that. And, um, and here's the thing. I don't, I, I'm not good at this. I'm horrible at this. I don't tell anybody what I'm going through. <coughs> Nobody. Everybody tells me what they're going through. Mm. You know? And so, I'm telling you something that I'm not doing in my own life, but I see that we need. And I'm not sure exactly how to get there. But, I will say this, I think you guys are getting closer. Yeah. Because I see a room full of men, like everything you just described, from different walks of life, different cultures, and here we are, man, brothers, laughing and talking and joking and spending time together. And I think the seeds of what I'm talking about can sprout and bring forth what I'm talking about. Um, but, I, but once again, it comes back to Jesus, man. The cool thing about men is we're slower to judge each other. You know why? Because we just don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Women care about everything. Yep. And they judge each other, and they, they're all like, like man, we're just like, yo, pass me the bacon, man. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, and like, we don't. And so as a result of that, there's a freedom in male fellowship that you don't get in, in when it's a mixed group. Amen. Yeah, really, man, just men being men. And like, so like we, we need to do stuff together. We need to hang out. We need to conquer something. Yeah. And, uh, and thank God for this. But I mean, how many other deeper fellowship than this, too? Hanging out outside of this, man. Hanging out outside of church. Going fishing. Going hunting, man. Going to a concert. Going to a sport event. Whatever. But we all get so focused in on our families and just being there for them that sometimes we forget to fellowship with each other. And it's something that we need. Yeah. And uh, I'm not standing before you telling you I've got it completely done. Because I'm so busy I don't even... I'm, I meet myself coming and going, man, with everything i got going on. And I don't have time to hang out with a bunch of guys. I don't do... I don't go to these programs. So I don't conduct them. And I know I need them, but I don't have time for them right now at this stage in my life. And each time I try to delegate somebody else to leave, it always fizzles out into nothing. So, yeah. praise God. Thank you, bud. Yeah. Yeah, man. You guys, let's give it up for these guys. We're doing a good job. Yeah. So, in closing, I just want to pray.
pray for us, man. So, Father, I just thank you for my friends and just the honor to be able to just speak into their hearts and their lives. And, Lord, we just thank you for these truths that you've given us. And thank you, Lord, that these truths, they, they, they make us free, Lord. They bring greater freedom into our lives. I thank you. Thank you for that. Lord, we just thank you for great days ahead and thank you for this fellowship. Thank you for blessing these folks, man, protecting them, keeping them, loving them, being friends to them, being a father to them, Lord. And we look to you for everything. Lord, we yeah. thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.